Hi everyone. So this slideshow is about Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. It's his classical approach to persuasion using ethos, logos, and pathos to persuade. And a little bit later on in the slideshow, I will be discussing fallacies. And by all means, the list is not extensive. There are more fallacies in your textbook, but it's just to give you an idea as to how fallacies are used in argumentation. So looking at Aristotle and his understanding of ethos and the whole point of rhetoric is he looked at rhetoric as an art and persuasion specifically as an art that could be used either morally or immorally. And it really just depended upon the character of the speaker. So starting off with the first, it's called a rhetorical proof ethos. He talked about this as being the most important rhetorical proof that if a speaker does not have credibility with the audience, he will not be able to persuade them. So we need logic and we need pathos, which is emotions, but the most important is a speaker's credibility. So ethos is defined as how a speaker demonstrates their credibility to their audience. And one way that a speaker can do that, according to Aristotle, is through practical wisdom, is through being a good person and through establishing goodwill toward the audience. So how can you do this as a speaker? Well, you can know what you're gonna talk about. So part of the pra practical wisdom is to actually know what you're talking about. So you don't wanna speak about a subject that you're not very familiar with or that you haven't done your research on or even that you don't really have much personal experience with. You wanna have some wisdom with the subject that you're talking about. So that's why it's so important to choose a topic that you already know something about that you're going to do research about so that you can speak from a place of knowledge because if you don't, people can see through that really easily. The second thing is to make sure that your speech is very well organized because if you digress and you're all over the place, people think that you're not a competent speaker. It may not be true, but that is part of the perception. You want to keep in mind that ethos, how credible you are, it's determined by your audience. It's not necessarily determined by how credible you think you are. It's how credible does your audience think you are. So it's really important to build throughout your speech and also just as far as being a good person. What that means is you don't have to be a perfect person, just a good person. It's about the, I Socrates said, it's about persuasion is about the good person speaking well. Ethics is the good person speaking well. So you just want to make sure that you have the right intentions, that you are using this topic and that you're sincere with your motivation for wanting to deliver this type of speech. And then finally, goodwill toward the audience so that you actually have goodwill toward the audience and you're not trying to manipulate them. People don't want to be manipulated. And sometimes if you've ever heard any speech that was uh, even a form of hate speech, well, oftentimes the intention of the speaker is not to truly persuade the audience. It's to spread hate and anger. And that would not be uh, establishing goodwill or having goodwill toward the audience. So that's something that you definitely want to stay away from. So other ways that you can do this is to establish your ethos, the perception of your credibility with your audience is you do have to look the part. You have to pay attention to how you're dressed. You have to pay attention to how you're groomed because people do assess a speaker's competency in part based on how they present themselves. So these are all things to keep in mind in your persuasive speech. How are you going to build your credibility with your audience? Yes, you will establish credibility in the introduction of your speech, but how will you continue, continue to build on that credibility throughout your entire speech? The next slide here is logos. <clears throat> logos literally means the word. And Aristotle used this term to refer to the rational, logical arguments that a speaker uses to persuade someone. You need to be able to reach a logical conclusion while supporting the message with evidence and reasoning. So when you're making an argument, think about this. Logos is the heart of your argument. The reasoning, inductive and deductive reasoning. So if you look at your evaluation form, you will be graded on your use of reasoning, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. And then that line of reasoning that you're using is going to be supported by evidence. And the evidence that you use might be facts, it might be statistics, it could be expert testimony, it could be lay testimony, 
It could be descriptions, explanations, but you need to think back, I believe it's from chapter eight that talks about the different types of supporting material that you can use in order to construct a solid argument. So remember, logos is the word, it is logical appeals, it is the heart of your argument because the argument that you, that you make needs to be sound, it needs to be logical, and it needs to be supported with evidence and reasoning. So if you look over here at the third slide, pathos, and I have all these emojis, and I think it's helpful in getting you to think about how can you use emotional appeals in your speech. So pathos is used to appeal to an audience's heart and emotions. You do this by establishing personal connections through stories and testimonials. Pathos can aim to evoke hopes and fears and often employs figurative language, or at least very descriptive and vivid language. One of the most effective ways to evoke emotions in an audience is to tell a story with an emotional, with an emotional connection with your audience. If you look here at the emojis, there are so many different emotions. When you, as a student of, of rhetoric, are learning about different emotions. Number one, you need to be able to understand your own emotions and identify your own emotions. So what is it that makes you feel sad? What is it that makes you feel anxious? What is it that makes you feel surprised, bored, indignant? All of these different emotions that you have and experience, what causes you to have these emotions? So number one, Aristotle would say you need, as a rhetorician, you need to be a student that studies emotions in general. So that's where psychology really comes into persuasion. So no emotions in yourself. And then how can you evoke specific emotions within your audience? If you want them to feel indignant about something or you want them to feel shame about something, how can you best evoke that specific emotion within your audience? So let's say I were to give a persuasive speech about conserving water. I might say something along the lines of, I might ask some questions. So how many of you flush the toilet every time you use it? How many of you just let the water run while you're brushing your teeth? How many of you wash your car once a week? So on and so forth. So you're wasting all of this water here. And then I would get into a little bit of perhaps cognitive dissonance. Well, you're part of the problem. We do have a water shortage, but we don't see it. We don't think we do because it's fairly cheap here in the state of Florida. It's fairly cheap in the United States. And then I would go on and on a bit about how in other parts of the country, there are shortages in water and people actually have to limit their use and intake of water and how that eventually will affect us all. So if we're not, if we're part of the problem and we don't want to be, we need to be part of the solution. So that's understanding an emotion. So if I want my audience to feel some guilt or shame, I might tell a story so that they feel some guilt or shame. And then I want them to feel hope. So I might tell a story to have them feel some guilt or shame and then bring them to, to hope. So again, pathos, it can't be the heart of your speech. Let's say your, your speech is about to persuade the audience to become a vegetarian and you show these really graphic images of animals being being slaughtered. Firstly, what happens here is typically you push your audience to the edge of the cliff and they fall off and you, you paralyze them. Either one, they're paralyzed because it's so horrific for them to view or two, they get enraged because there's nothing that can be done about it for you as a person. And then the typical emotional response is anger. And you don't want that to happen because if your whole goal is persuasion, you don't want to make people angry. So you really need to think about crafting your argument and using stories that can evoke specific emotions within the audience, but the correct emotions, the emotions that you really want them to feel. So if you were to show something, you might want to tone it down. Let's say a visual image of an animal. You might want to tone it down so that it's palatable, so that an audience can actually view what it is that you are showing that it is not too harsh. So you really have to think about how your audience thinks and what they can handle. What specific emotion and emotions that you want them to feel. And then you incorporate that into your speech, like I said, through the stories that you tell. You can also incorporate pathos through visual images. You can also incorporate your pathos by your vocal delivery. How you feel is often communicated by your tone, by your pitch, other vocal qualities, such as your rate of speech.
So keep those things in mind. Ethos, logos, and pathos all need to be part of this final argument that you give in your speech. Ethos is your appeal to credibility. How credible does the audience believe that you are? Logos is logic. How logical is the argument? So the argument is making a judgment. Is this a logical argument? And then pathos is your emotional appeals. You want to communicate and convey and evoke specific emotions within your audience. So, and that helps to get the audience to act on what it is that you want them to act. So ethos, logos, pathos, do not confuse. Oftentimes people will confuse ethos with emotions and do not make that mistake. Ethos is credibility, pathos is emotions. Moving on here to avoiding faulty reasoning. A fallacy is false reasoning, and that occurs when someone attempts to persuade without ad adequate evidence or with arguments that are irrelevant or inappropriate. It is a misleading and unsound argument. So within a speech, we have all these little mini arguments supporting the main argument. The main argument is your claim. It's your thesis statement. So these mini arguments that you have need to support that claim, that bottom line, that thesis statement. So some of the fallacies, and there are so many fallacies out there, but we have just listed a few, is the causal fallacy, is the first one. A causal fallacy involves making a faulty causal connection. Simply because one event follows another does not mean that the two are related. That is a fallacy. So for example, the increased earthquake and hurricane activity is caused by the increase in violence and war in our society. So we're saying that one causes the other, but that is just, that doesn't make sense. That is a fallacy, that's a false argument. Number two, oh, sorry, I, I didn't move on to the slide, sorry about that. <clears throat> so number two is the bandwagon fallacy. And so I have this, this little meme here, this comic, to illustrate the bandwagon fallacy. So the bottom line of a bandwagon fallacy is that assuming a claim is true because many or most other people believe it. And the example that we use, everyone should get the iPhone X because it's the most popular phone to own. So what, because everyone's doing it, I should do it. So it's a common argument that children use with their parents. Well, everyone else gets to do it, so, so why shouldn't I? And so that's just a bandwagon fallacy. And if only your parents knew. Moving on. Okay, so continued is the either or fallacy. An either or fallacy is a type of fallacy in which a person makes a statement that presents only two possible options when there are actually more than two. So rarely in this world are there only two possible solutions or two possible options. So the example is, the first example is either people start volunteering their time to work for this community or your taxes will increase. So it's saying either you have to start volunteering your time or taxes are going to increase. That doesn't really make sense. Another example would be we have to raise local real estate taxes by 1% or else we will not get a new trauma facility in Manatee County. So are there other ways to find sources or resources or funding for the trauma hospital besides just raising taxes by 1%. There are other alternatives. There are other solutions. So if someone says that, that is an either or fallacy. So remember, when you hear either this or that, you know that that is, that is a fallacy. Number two, hasty generalization. A person who reaches a conclusion from too little evidence or non-existent evidence is making a hasty generalization. So the example that is used is it's clear that our schools can't educate our children well. My niece went to school for six years and she still can't read at her grade level. Well, there may be many other reasons for that. You're making a big jump to state that the schools can't educate our children well. That is a hasty generalization. That is a fallacy. Like I said, there might be many, many other reasons for this person's niece not being able to read at her grade level. Number three is an ad hominem. This is really popular with politicians, if you haven't noticed. It's also known as attacking the person. An ad hominem, it's taken from the Latin, meaning to the man. Yes, they did not use gender neutral language in fourth century BC. So we have learned from their mistakes. 
approach. So what this is, it's an approach that involves attacking irrelevant characteristics of the person who is proposing the idea rather than attacking the idea itself. So bottom line, this is a personal attack. When someone's making an argument and then they turn and attack the actual person who is delivering the opposing argument, that is called an ad hominem. So one example, so if you look at example two on your list, asserting that someone's geographical location prevents him or her from being able to make a clear judgment. Quote, you've only ever lived in an urban environment. The issues of those in other areas is clearly beyond you. So you're personally attacking for someone saying, hey, you've only lived here. How can you possibly know what it's like in the country? So perhaps this person has done research in the country, in the country. Perhaps this person has family and relatives that have lived in the country. So when you personally attack an individual, what you're trying to do is, is take that individual's character and discredit them so that your argument looks stronger. The next one is a red herring fallacy. This is a diversionary tactic that avoids key issues. Again, politicians use this a lot. In fact, politicians use pretty much all of these fallacies quite often. And once you get really skilled at learning how to discern fallacies that are used in arguments, you're just basically going to be thinking that all arguments are fallacious. Not all, but many arguments are pretty fallacious, full of these fallacies. So with a red herring fallacy, instead of addressing the issue, the speaker uses irrelevant facts or arguments. Speakers use a red herring when they want to distract an audience from the real issue. So here, the real issue, if you look at the example, the real issue is mercury and seafood, how unsafe it is. So the, the example is the level of mercury and seafood may be unsafe, but what will fishers do to support their family? So again, it's important that people are able to support their family, but the issue at hand that's being, dis, being discussed is mercury. And so it's trying to, mercury and seafood. So what it's doing is trying to distract from the real issue at hand by getting people to look in other directions. All right, moving on to the next slide is our last two fallacies that we have here. And what I have here, this is the Biebs, Justin Bieber. Yep, I have my animals. Hopefully you can hear my dogs. They're going to bark here in a minute. Hopefully you can still hear me. So Justin Bieber is here holding proactive and he's trying to sell you proactive. What does he know about proactive? So it's what this is, it's an appeal to misplaced authority. The other example would be if Brad Pitt and he's talking about saving the environment. He is an actor. He might have an opinion, but he is not an expert. So this is considered an appeal to misplaced authority. And this is when a speaker uses an authority as evidence in an argument when the person is not really an expert on the facts relevant to the argument or topic. When advertisements use football players to endorse automobiles and television stars to promote soft drinks, we are faced with a fallacious appeal to misplaced authority. In this case, it's proactive. And the last one is non sequitur. This is when a conclusion or statement does not logically follow from the previous arguments or statement. So for example, Maria drives a car, she must be a wealthy person. Well, one does not necessarily indicate the other. So conclusion or statement that does not logically flow. Maria drives a car, she must be a wealthy person. Again, you're making an assumption here just because she drives a nice car, let's even say it's a nice car, does not necessarily mean it does not follow that this person is a wealthy person. So I hope that you found this discussion helpful. And by all means, before you take the quiz, make sure if you have any questions that you contact me and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. And remember, this is really important, one, to review before taking the quiz and two, before writing your speech outline and three, before taking your last exam, exam number four.